Yeah, I think um, yeah, it's been in conversation, obviously, all the way through the season. Um, and we had some guys step in and do some pretty impressive things in, in the middle of our order. When you look at the ask of a young Paul DeYoung to step into that role, um, but also realizing that we've been very fortunate in this organization for a while where you have a Mark McGuire kind of fill that spot in the order, and then all of a sudden you have a, a Pujols uh, followed by a Matt Holiday that was that presence. And I think as you watch teams that have sustained success, there's typically a, there's a presence in the middle of that lineup. And, uh, so that has been a focus of this club and still believing that you know, we can develop those style players and uh, we have some guys that are developing into those kinds of players. But right now, to, um, to, to put a couple of players or a player in that spot is, uh, is a priority. Yeah, I, I think always open. Um, I think you, you walk before you run, so try to get any kind of piece that fits at this time uh, would be a, a huge step in the right direction and never uh, closing the door to the potential of even um, adding to that. You started early. Yeah. Did I miss anything good? Nothing. Don't worry. Mike, you can't probably say anything until things are official, but obviously Ozuna's name has come up. And yeah, I've heard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any general thoughts on him that you could share? Even though he's not officially in charge. Yeah, good player. And I, I think as I think our organization did a great job of um, being very aggressive, even kind of maybe outside our norm um, with the talks that happened with Stanton. There's a, those are not, not a secret. And trying to um, show our fan base the commitment that, that we have to, to try and make our team better. And as you have those conversations, you do start opening up doors of what else could that look like if it does not come through, which it didn't. And uh, Ozuna is one of those names that you have to have great respect, especially as much as we see him, not just you know through the season, but spring training, we, we've seen him quite a bit. And um, Yelich, another player that has been thrown out there. There's a number of players throughout the league that you have great appreciation for. And, and uh, you watch the way they go about their business and try to position it as if that would be a good fit in your own club. Um, so uh, once again, uh, we're at that point where, yeah, there's a lot of talks going on and we're at that necessary point of, of talking uh, through through health always, no matter what the player is. That's, it's not just a formality. We're always trying to figure out, does this player fit one with our club? Uh, can you make something work? And then also you're always talking about whether um, there's any health issues that the medical team needs to work, look at. And so. A lot going on, a lot of moving pieces to make any kind of move work. Yeah, depending on what pieces we had, um, I think Tommy Pham did a great job of showing uh, his ability to play center field. Obviously, it's no secret that Dex can play there. You know, I think something to be very uh, aware of and something we're very appreciative of is uh, the humility of our players. Um, to maybe go to a spot where they haven't been before or you know as, as uh, some of them are, are recruited to be here to play a certain position but to understand kind of how our team unfolds and what our need is and try to um, put the needs of the team above above their own and that's that's hard for any of us to do um, but we've had guys who've done that on a consistent basis guys bouncing from position to position guys bouncing from different spots in the lineup um, and you go in with your ideals uh, of what you would like to see, and you're going to have to to be flexible. And I thought our guys have done a great job of that in the past. Some of our better players um, kind of leading the way with that, which then makes it an easier sell to the younger guys. But every year, uh, as you bring in new new pieces, uh, you, I think we're all going to have to um, be be very um, be very fluid with, with how it comes together. And um, it does take special people to handle that and. And do it in a way that, that doesn't create issues inside the clubhouse. Have you personally had that conversation with Dexter? Um, we've been in somewhat contact. Once again, you don't necessarily go there too far till you know exactly what all plays out. So, I think that's a conversation um, that yeah we've had personally that conversation even throughout last season. Just talking about just being real, right? I mean, um, talking about where every player goes as as their as their just their career progresses and what that could potentially look like. And then you bring in new pieces that you didn't necessarily see coming. Who, who would have ever thought that we bring up a player from A-ball last year who's a, 
predominantly a center fielder, and how would that potentially play? And that was something that we expected, so there's no reason to have the conversation ahead of time. And the same thing goes right now, is that we just wait and see what what happens, what pieces we have, and then have those conversations on the back end. Mike, bigger picture, um, every manager will um, sort of talk up the division they're in, but I'm curious, I mean, there's no sort of rebuilding team at the bottom in your division, you know, at starting over. It's, it's a pretty competitive division, as is. Do you sort of view it that way? Like, usually there's a team or two that's really trying to start up, but you guys have plenty of teams that are all right there. Yeah, strong division. There's no, no question about it. And... Um, Every team that we see is, is uh, making progressive moves to get better and, and, and not just be relevant, but to win this division. And that's the way we go into it too. Uh, you know, it's um, we've been fortunate because there are teams, obviously, as you go through different phases. But uh, I don't see any team in our our division being in that particular spot. I mean, you look at whatever team you want, and every one of them, whether it's matching their lineups or some of the arms they have through their their staff. Um, very talented. I mean, not too many years ago, just a couple uh, years ago, you're looking at multiple teams fighting for those spots in the wild card, and um, it's um, it's going to be a strong division for a while. Yeah, I think it goes back to that that impact bat, you know, that. Uh, Whatever we could do to, to have that presence in the middle of the order that you see with so many of these teams, um, you know, there's so many. Uh, even as you watch teams through the playoffs, almost all the way through, uh, you, you have a, a solid lineup. There's always that group in the middle of the established uh, bat that, that you kind of supplement and uh, add the other pieces too. And so I think that was the one that stood out more than anything else. Did you see add two? Really yeah, I don't think that's off the table. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Mo and Gersh and uh, Bill have been very forward to the fact that, you know, we'll do what we need to do. There's, there's going to be, obviously, some limits to, to what any organization can do. Um, but the St. Louis Cardinals have been committed this offseason to make the moves possible um, to help our club take it to another level. And once again, not to compete, not to be relevant, uh, but winning, winning. That's, that's uh, what... Most of the teams are here talking about what are the pieces that are keeping us from being where we feel we should be. And um, a presence in the middle, whether it's one bat or, or more, is uh, something that we feel is very important. Mike, what do you think is driving that? Do you think it's the opportunity that the trade market presents? Do you think it's the financial opportunity that you guys have with the payroll you have? Or do you think it's two years of finishing out of playoffs? Yeah, I'd say it's the last more than anything else. You know, we've been. Uh, very accustomed to to being a part of October, and um, you know that's a. I don't want to ever lose that. I don't want our guys to ever feel that that's being spoiled. We've worked very hard to be a team with some s- sustained success here long before I got here, and um, to keep that torch going. What are we doing that that's not allowing us to be there, or what can we do that can get us back? I think those are are great questions to ask, and um, you know. I, First and foremost, we always go back to controlling the controllables, which we're going to talk a lot about culture. We're going to talk about the way that we work and the way that we improve. We feel that those are things that we can control. Um, And from a staff, we we take the best players we can get, but we also have to be honest evaluators of where we think we can improve. And talking about the presence in the lineup and also talking about um, the need in the back end of our bullpen, those are things that we feel uh, are are places where we can improve, plus the things that we can do individually to continue to help our players improve and grow. Mike, if money is the number one thing in free agency, there always have been a couple of organizations that I'm sure you heard over the years of players say, I'd like to play for that group, the way they go about their business. Is that still in play, do you think, in today's free agency world? You know, I'd, I'd like to think so. Um, but, you know, bottom line, and you know, I, I don't blame players a lot of times. It comes down to what team shows you the most that they want you, uh, and it's going to come down to an offer now. It goes in, in phases during careers, too, where guys have been part of maybe a, a team that hasn't won much, and it's something that they desire. Or they've been there, lost it, and they, they want to get back to a team that competes, and then they're going to have to take an analysis of whether or not the, get, the, the team they're talking to has has plans to move in that direction. And Once again, I hope that's something that we're always in the conversation about because I believe that's some place that we should always be. Um, but all in all, uh, that's always been a big selling part, point for our organization is the fact that um, it's not necessarily anything that, that we as uh, staff bring as much as what our fan base brings. Um, it's, it's a unique atmosphere. Uh, it's a great place to play. 
um, it has a different vibe. And uh, you know, even a, a year last year that we fought like we had to, we draw 3.4 million people. You're going to be in front of 40,000 people every night that, that just live and die with, with how you do your job. And uh, that makes it a great atmosphere, and it does make it a great selling point. Mike, uh, we heard Joe Madden say yesterday with uh, Chicago, and he really stays out of the business side. And I'm interested as how hands-on or involved are you with Mike and the guys as far as uh, free agency pickups, maybe the rules the deal. Um, I'm as involved as they need me to be, one, um, and uh, I feel very fortunate they keep me in conversations. Uh, I like to learn, too, so as we're uh, going through different ideas and possibilities, I, uh, we're here, uh, we're spending time together, and it's a great opportunity for me to sit with some of our analytics department and, and pick their brain as we're comparing a couple different players, and they're flying through their computers so fast you can hardly keep up with them, uh, trying to show me some of the... Uh, the data that, that supports the moves that we're making because we have some brilliant people upstairs and to understand that side of the game and then for them to hear some of the things that we see and then try to put value to that also, I, I believe it, it needs to be a collaborative effort and we're fortunate in our organization that it, um, it has been that way and they humor me, you know, they'll slow things down a little bit and speak my language a little better and, and help me understand where it is that they're going but I think it opens up doors then for application into what I do um, so then I can take we build up that rapport and that and that relationship to the point of, of them helping me understand some of the analytics of the decisions that I make and, uh, and, and them helping me grow in some of the things that uh, we're deficient in and areas that we can improve. And I think um, any team that uh, that is having success right now, you're seeing some of that cohesiveness between the information um, and then the people and trying to figure out how to maximize both, both departments. <coughs> Sometimes it's um, what I see. Uh, other times it's it's also networking and touching base with other, uh, not just um, teammates, not just other coaches of potential uh, trade players or, or free agents. Um, it's, it's talking to some of the uh, support cast, whether it be former trainers or clubhouse people, anybody that can give us a little insight, you know, tell us about the person. We've got enough data to tell us about the, the player. Uh, how will this guy particularly fit? And um, you know, it, it, it's a balance of all of the above. If, if you value culture, which we do, um, and we're not just uh, trying to get everybody that's a clone, but we're looking for people that believe in, in the, some of the parts. Is, uh, it, it really makes up that whole and, and how much each individual guy, if he can get outside of himself, can make us better. And that's something that um, we feel, uh, as you, you talk to some of the experiences they've had in other cities, it can be, be a very valuable tool. So we, we take every resource possible, and the organization has been good about including not just myself, but the rest of our staff. As far as back into your bullpen, you've reached an agreement with Gregerson. Do you feel like you need another arm back there? Yeah, pretty incredible transformation, right? A year ago, um, with Sung Wan Oh doing a fantastic job for us, being one of the better closers in the league, and having Trevor Rosenthal sitting right there. You had an eighth inning guy and a Segrist. You bring in uh, Brett Cecil, you think that you're covered on the back end, and next thing you know, um, we're having to go get a Juan Nicasio. And I think that just shows you can't have enough. And we're, we're uh, still keeping our eyes open and ears open. believe we have some good young arms that could be option. Um, but um, the teams, backtracking to us talking about winning, you're not seeing winning teams at the end of the season that don't have um, a, a legitimate back end of their bullpen. And that's guys who have been there, done that, and have had some, some prolonged success in that position. Would you like experience that? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's you know, part of the equation. I don't think it's the entire story, uh, but I think it does have to go into consideration. I think that um, you can certainly, and we've seen it, um, some of the, the young power arms that are coming up, you can put them into that spot and give them those opportunities and see what they do with it. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty tough way to start your season. If uh, you have an opportunity to go maybe get a couple arms who have pitched in the back end of the game, not necessarily the ninth, but... Uh, preferably so, guys who have closed out games. It's a, it's a different animal, and I understand um, I understand the numbers that might not support that as well. But and, and from the humanistic side, uh, it, it's a it's a different animal, and it's good to have some guys who've been there and done it and had success there. What is the conversation with about where he might play? 
Um, yeah, we're we're not making any broad statement about what Matt Carpenter needs to do at this point. Um, staying in touch with Matt, most of it's just about him um, being the kind of player that he wants to be, which comes back to no matter where he would be on the field. Um, it's about athleticism. It's about moving. It's about the quick twitch. It's about first step. Um, it's about strength. It's about speed. It's about the consistency in his approach, what kind of hitter he wants to be. Um, and I don't think, I, I think it's too premature without knowing the rest of the pieces to our puzzle to tell Matt what he should do, except just go get better. And, um, and, and he's, he's so driven for excellence anyhow that uh, that's an easy conversation to have. And you know, going back to, to the question earlier, um, the humility that he's shown over the last several years from being an all-star to position to then tr- being willing to go to another. I had him mid-season last year you know, telling me that he'd, if he needed me to go somewhere else, he'd do that too. I mean, that that's so rare for that high-level player to have that kind of mentality, but it also, I believe, sets the tone for the rest of our club uh, when the younger players come up that, that they understand for, for a team to uh, have the kind of success and to maximize the ability that they have. Sometimes we have to think outside the box and possibly put a player in a different position than what they would would typically be, but as soon as we get that information and we have a good idea, I think it's good for them to know. I, I think in December it might not be as important as January. Um, January, I'd like for wherever each of our players is going to be, for them to have a good idea what the expectation is for them coming into the spring, uh, position specific, and uh, those conversations will continue to happen. But at this point, it's uh, just get ready to, to improve yourself as, a, as an overall baseball player. And uh, you know, and thank a guy like that for being available to do whatever we need him to do. Do you think uh, you could start spring training with a conversation with him and Dex about the off and how to kind of approach that new spot? Yeah, I think as we get closer, I, some of those conversations have already happened. Um, and you know, Matt in particular, uh, uh, he gets very offended when we talk about him not being able to hit in a certain spot in the order. I mean, it, it sounds. And, and, and as you say it, you would think that it would, it really shouldn't work that way. Uh, but we can't deny how it played for our club last year and for him in specific. Once our uh, our offense um, really started hitting its its stride, uh, Matt was in the, in the leadoff spot. And that same humility that I talked about with Matt moving positions, you can talk about Dex bouncing around in the in the order. Uh, we we brought him in here with the idea of being our leadoff hitter, and um, ended up needing him to, to hit in a different spot in order for it to be better for the entire club. And I really appreciate how Dex went about that. Um, I want to hear what they like, what they want to. I think it's crazy not to at least um, understand what it is that they uh, would like to see, the kind of player that they view themselves as, and then try and move in, in that direction. But um, sometimes you have to have those conversations that that are just blunt in the fact that this is what our team needs and we need you to fill that spot. And and these guys have been impressively good about doing whatever the club needs. Mike, where can we expect to see us in a lineup? You know, nothing's been done there yet, so you can't speak on that right now. Mike, you mentioned the possibility of another bat being on the table. Positionally, is there an easier way for that to work? I mean, obviously, it's the number third baseman that would rumor to be available for various teams, things like that. Yeah, I think... You know, any way that it's amazing um, conversations that start with other clubs, and you know, I've, I've um, you know enjoy that aspect of these winter meetings as well as some of the just spitballings going on, right? And all of a sudden a name pops up, or somebody would send a text into uh, one of the front office members, and you just start thinking, how would that apply, and how would that affect what we have? I mean, this, so it's all across the board, and I think uh, the idea is how can we be better, and then that's kind of your common statement you're going to hear from every GM, every manager. Um, I don't think you close the doors. I think uh, you, you remain very, um, very open to whatever might happen, whatever might be out there, and then adjust accordingly. But you know, I don't think um, I don't think that uh, you'd be doing yourself any favor to, to close doors at this point and just kind of see what comes across your table. And, and just follow up philosophically. You think if you guys did make an acquisition of a big bat, you trade someone who had, you had control of for a while, would make more sense than like a one-year guy. I think it's a trend in the game for sure. Um, you know, when, when you're uh, letting go cost-controlled assets to bring somebody in for a year, uh, you're not you're not seeing um, oftentimes um, you know, teams leaning in that direction when you can go in the other. And I, I get that. So just trying to understand the economics and the long-term view of not just our organization, but how the rest of the game is seen 
um, how their budgetary restraints and, and trying to, uh, to to keep control of players as long as they can. I, I, I get that and I see the value, but every once in a while, I think, too, um, you open up that door. Can we bring this guy in? What do we got to do to try and maybe sign him up long deal for a long-term deal? So all those things are always on the table. What was the value of the meeting you guys had with your staff? Achieve through that or get to know one another with <laughs> yeah, just um, you know, just two full days of, um, of of meetings, kind of one um, getting everybody together. Some introductions needed to be made, and um, yeah, excited about our staff. Excited about adding some new pieces, bringing back some some uh, some older pieces. Um, but just uh, the idea of, of communication, making sure everybody. First and foremost, understood uh, this is your role. I mean, we had guys that I wanted to make sure that they all heard. You know, I, I've said this about Willie McGee a couple times, who I just can't say enough about. Um, but you know, he's going to be serving uh, uh, multiple roles for us. And the fact that we'd be crazy not to use him as an asset with John Mabry and Bill Miller. Uh, on the offensive side. Uh, we're going to need him to help out our base runners, especially our base stealers. And his focus and his priority will be with helping our outfielders and with the young outfielders we have. I just believe he's going to be a priceless tool to us. And um, Obviously, you know, getting Jose Okendo back into the mix, and we all understand the kind of uh, coach that he is, the kind of third base coach as well as infield instructor. Um, just uh, making sure that kind of we understand what the on-field but also the spring training responsibilities are, and then also starting to, to make those contact points with the players. These are your guys. These are some things that, that they could probably use, maybe a little guidance and direction, uh, whether it's some advice uh, for some of our base dealers. That's a contact for Willie, and um, it just we're all, all across the board to make sure that you know, the, the open lines of communication start this early in the offseason. Given the amount of information that we gave today, do you think the modern player understands the game? I think the modern day player understands the modern day game better um, and you just have to adjust and adapt. Um, I, I think our, our guys are much more in tune with the analytics. Um, they weren't relevant in a previous generation so I think the, they'd be doing themselves a disservice. I know that our guys are are understanding track man data better. Um, they want that information in, and it's accessible to them. Many of these guys are heading in facilities that it'll have hit tracks that, that's talking to them about their launch angle. It's the uh, the track man data that, that, that talks to them about uh, their exit velocity. Th those sort of things are just commonplace conversations anymore. And we're starting to see that um, almost as a necessity as we train to make sure that we're not just going through repetitions, but we're going through quality repetitions and um, making sure that what they are wanting to do, if they're wanting to improve their power, then there's probably some, some metrics that they're going to have to follow um, to, to get that better chance of that happening. So it's um, I, I much like front office and clubhouse staff, how that's kind of integrated, I think the players are also understanding the value, and so we're making those um, conversations happen with our front office personnel to where the players see this as a resource, not just to the coaches, but also an open resource to the players. Are you surprised that Willie was ready to commit to major coaching job? Yeah. And even Jose coming back, at what point did you kind of learn of their interest? Yeah, I knew um, things were, were, were heading in that direction with Jose, even during the season last year, but Willie was a surprise for me. And um, I, first and foremost, I applaud our guys um, and, and anybody that could should be in the game when um, when they make the choice to, to be more relevant at home. Um, you know, it's something I deeply respect because I know they um, almost all of them would love to be in uniform, but when they make that sacrifice, especially in those those pivotal years in their kids' lives where they they prioritize and make that family um, their their focus at that time. And so yeah, it surprised me that I knew where Willie's kids were and. And a lot of times it's just whether or not the family structure sees it as a viable option. And um, so I was extremely happy. I've thrown it at Willie almost every year. And I just kind of anticipate the same answer. And he shocked me uh, when he said that he had already spoken with his family and they believe it's time. And um, just have a great respect of how that methodical process uh, had developed. And uh, we're going to be better for it. We haven't done Mike Maddox yet, but can you kind of describe the conversations you've had with him, how you think he's going to impact your, your staff? Yeah, I mean, guy who's kind of seen it all, and um, whether it's internally, family-wise, or whether it's some of the staffs. I mean, just look where he just left and the kind of talent that he had. Um, he's uh, he's a guy who's had 
it has helped develop some Cy Young style style pitchers. And for us, I think it's um, it's, it's going to be um, a great voice to some of these young, talented players. As you look at the development of Carlos Martinez, there's a whole nother level there. Um, and, and the baseball world really hasn't even seen Alex Reyes yet, who we're going to have to probably go a little slow with this year. But he should be a, a very important piece to what we do to go along with uh, some of the more established. As you, but you talk about a Luke Weaver and you talk about the development of a Flaherty. Um, and, and, you know, you, you want that voice to be coupled with um, the ace style leadership of, of an Adam Wainwright. You know, we have a, a pitching coach and a very successful veteran pitcher that can both be voices to these young players. It's a very fertile ground for them to, to capitalize and maximize you know, the potential that they have to develop. Mike, it wasn't very long ago that lineups were basically the same every day. If I hit fifth, I know I hit fifth. Is today's player, and whether it's the analytics and whether it's a matchup thing, certainly a lot of structure has changed over the years. Is there an awareness now that you might not be a three-hole hitter, you might not be a five-hole hitter? To win this game tonight, we might be doing more than they would have done a generation or two ago. Yeah, and and I get um, the importance of consistency, and I, I, I think every manager that has sat up here would like to tell you I'd love to write eight names in for 150 games, and uh, they'll line up exactly how they should and how you think it should look, and you just let it roll. I mean, that's that'd be really nice, but that's not the game that we're in. And it's more um, how do the pieces come together, and there should be a couple spots that are pretty solid. Um, but I, I think it comes back to we've mentioned it a couple times. It's almost changing the mindset. Is um, if we can get outside, which is hard to do because the Everything that we see externally is telling us that it's kind of about us and our numbers. And um, when we know collectively, if we're going to have a, a good chance of success, we got to kind of separate from some of that to the point where we, what, what's better for us as a club? And if, uh, if guys can not take such ownership to necessarily a position or necessarily a position in the order, um, it's going to help our overall chance of success. Which, to me, when you buy into that, I think a natural byproduct is going to be that individual success, but you're going to be part of a winning club. You're going to be part of a winning experience that once you go through that, you'll never want to go back to anything different. So uh, I think it's, it's kind of rewiring, and we try and do that through conversations like this um, and through conversations that we'll have throughout spring training to try and help guys see um, what, what we believe it looks like to be part of a winning culture. And part of that is... Um, not taking such ownership to things that pertain only to you. Mike, how about your initial reaction to Stan? First of all, as, as I said earlier, I was just very impressed the fact that uh, we were involved in those conversations. I mean, that's a big step for our organization when you start talking about that kind of um, that, that kind of commitment. So I was um, excited uh, to think about, which I think it was just that that step forward that our ownership was making to say. You know, listen, St. Louis Cardinal fan base, we're going to be relevant this winter. And this is going to be something that we're taking very seriously. Um, we, we know that uh, we can get better, and, and we're willing to step up and make our best best step forward. And, um, you know, unfortunately that didn't work, but I think that is just kind of parlayed into, okay, now what are we going to do? And uh, we're excited about about how that uh, – how, how that'll look as we get closer to spring training. Mike, we we'll can take one more, and then we need to wrap up here. So, yeah. um, could you talk about the decision that Michael Mike um, and um, if you have a chance to meet today? Yeah, I met Miles briefly. Um, he was coming up to, to do his official um, meet with uh, the front office while I was heading to another meeting. But uh, I've been in contact with him, just explaining to him kind of how we viewed his potential role. Um, we look at him as a starter and been very excited about what we've seen of him in Japan and how great of a job he's done there and um, <coughs> lines up really well with, with what we see as a, a potential starter for our club. And so for him to prepare to come and compete for that spot and realize that there's some great opportunity there. And um, you know, one of those guys that uh, it's, a, it's a great story of what he was able to do with his career by going over to Japan and pitching the way that he has. And um, hopefully that translates into success over here for a long time.